Muy buenos días, muy buenas tardes, muy buenas noches. Este es Luis Alberto Jovel trayéndole una entrevista con el autor de este libro, Pablo y la esperanza de gloria, Constantin Campbell. Y desde ahora voy, ya no voy a hablar en español, vamos a hablar en inglés y, vamos a, y, y van a ver ustedes los, eh, los subtítulos abajo y van a ver nuestra entrevista con el doctor Constantin Campbell. Con, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Yes, it's very cold here in Australia. I'm in my garage and, um, and that's why I, I <laughs> oh. have this. And, oh, but, yeah. I, but I saw that in New South Wales, you guys had um, some snow coming down. Oh, we did. It was amazing. Yeah, we had a little bit of snow here in Canberra. Mm. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen snow in Canberra. I saw lots of snow in Chicago when I lived there, but not in Canberra. Yes. Uh, and to let anybody, everybody know, Canberra is the capital of Australia. It's not Sydney. <laughs> Correct. Everybody... Thank you. Thank you. Very few people know that outside Australia. <laughs> yes. Yes. So can you tell us something about your, your academic background, Con, so, so my mm -hmm. audience know who you are, where you study? Sure. Uh, yeah, I, um, I'm a professor and associate research director at the Sydney College of Divinity. And uh, prior to that, I was a New Testament professor at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in Chicago. And prior to that, uh, I taught New Testament and Greek at Moore Theological College in Sydney. Uh, my PhD is uh, from Macquarie University in Sydney. And my theological uh, study it was from Moore College in Sydney. Mm. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a New Testament scholar, uh, but I've published research on ancient Greek and the New Testament in general and the Apostle Paul in particular. Yes, and that's what we're going to be looking at, at, uh, at your book, uh, Paul and the Hope of Glory. Sorry, uh, I, I would like just to show the, that I have your, that I'm not only, I, I don't only have the, the Spanish version, I have the English version <laughs> as well, so I've invested. <laughs> you are indeed. Yes. But, and I'd like to um, follow some questions because um, because it, it is my understanding that this is one of um, the best books around or the most one of the most complete because even yourself you 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 said it in one of the in one of your the, um, interviews that I saw that you have done a, a more through research in more passages than previous uh, authors regarding uh, Poe and, and eschatology. Um. Well, my goal was really to look at everything that Paul wrote that I think connects to the theme of eschatology. Um, and that also includes the letters that scholars regard as mm. disputed. Uh, so, uh, but from my point of view, as long as they bear Paul's name mm -hmm. uh, and they're in the New Testament, then... Could, could, could um, you say which one they are for my audience, please? Uh, those letters that are disputed? So the disputed epistles are generally regarded to be Ephesians and Colossians uh, and the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy and Titus in particular. Um, sometimes some others might be disputed, but um, they're, the, they're generally re regarded as the disputed epistles. Um, but some of those epistles are very important for the mm. theme of eschatology. Um, and so my, first of all, I, I believe Paul wrote them. I don't believe... Uh, I'm not persuaded by the arguments that um, someone other than Paul wrote those letters. But um, in any case, um, I sort of take a canonical approach to mm -hmm. Paul, which is the, the Paul we know is the Paul of the canon of the Bible. Um, so if his letters are in, in the canon, if they're in the New Testament, then uh, we'll treat them as Paul. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And because uh, it's my understanding, it's from this 1800s that the, that the letters have been questioned. It's yeah, it's recent. The, the, it's a recent. Yes, the earliest is in the 1700s, but generally mm. in the 1800s, uh, that's when some of these um, letters were were questioned as to their authenticity. And I, I've just actually published a commentary on Ephesians and um, looked you know, fairly deeply into the authorship question. Oh, yeah. And I, it, I just find the arguments really unpersuasive okay. it, <laughs> against Pauline authorship. Yeah. In which series? The Pillar series. Okay. I, I know which one. So yeah. I'll, I'll be looking for it. Maybe, maybe maybe I'll bring you back. Maybe, maybe yes, I'll, please, I'll, maybe, I'll be happy. Yes. Maybe I'll convince my, my, my friend to translate it uh, for, for Kerigma. And, and, and we oh, he should. He absolutely yes. should. Okay. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> I know he's going to be looking at this um uh, it's, this written, so. <laughs> it's written in very simple English compared okay. to other commentaries. Mm. So 
Well, it would be good to translate. Yes, that would be great then. Well, to get into the questions then, in your book, you argue that Paul's understanding of salvation and the hope of glory is grounded in his Christology. Mm. Can you explain what you mean by this and how it relates to Paul's mm. broader theological framework? And like you said, you you take mm. Paul as a can in a canonical sense, mm. uh, not not um, like some other theological books that I know that they only study somebody from England who passed away. No, uh, yes, who only study certain letters, and that was theology yeah. of Paul. And when and, and when I took it, I bought it because oh, I know this guy, <laughs> and then it's missing. <laughs> <laughs> it's missing a few letters. Yeah, yes, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yes, it's quite uh, disappointing when that happens. Mm. Um, well, I my view is that Paul's um, understanding of eschatology really comes out of his understanding of Christ. Mm. And um, this begins for Paul with Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Mm -hmm. Because Paul, I, I believe, interprets Jesus' resurrection in light of his pre-existing Jewish theology. And in... Um, in Jewish theology, um, the Jews held a belief for resurrection, but it was a, a general resurrection from the dead at the end of time, uh, on the last day. And so, and you, you see that when 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 Jesus comforts um, Martha mm. in in um, John chapter eleven after Lazarus has died, and he says to her, uh, "Your brother will rise again," and she says, "I know he will rise again on the last day." Um, so that's that's a reflection of this common Jewish belief that the God will raise the dead on the last day. So when Paul sees that Jesus has been resurrected from the dead now, mm. he interprets that eschatologically to mean the end has come already in Jesus ahead of time. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's and that's how we get um, the view that is throughout the New Testament, not only in Paul's writings, of what we what might call the overlap of the ages, that the old and the new are overlapping together. The new age has already begun, but the old age has not yet been completely wrapped up. Um, so we have this overlap of the ages, and that, that, that creates a tension in the New Testament, an mm -hmm. eschatological tension. Um, and Paul regularly exhorts his readers to live as people of the day, not mm -hmm. of the night. The night is the old age but the day is the new age. Um, and if you belong to Christ, then you belong to the day, you belong to the new. Um, and uh, his eschatology falls out from, from that understanding, primarily through the resurrection of Jesus. Um, he understands that now the end has already become present mm. now. Uh, and um, that means that our salvation um, is also, he's able to say you, we're able to say as Christians, we have been saved, even though salvation is supposed to happen at the end of time at judgment day as well. Mm -hmm. But we can say we have been saved now because the end has come in Jesus. And so if we trust in Jesus now, mm -hmm. um, our, we uh, receive a physical resurrection from the dead. And this is where Ephesians is important because in chapter mm -hmm. two, it yes. says you are spiritually dead. You are in your, dead in your transgressions and sins, but God has made you alive with Christ and he's even raised you up with Christ and seated you with Christ in the heavens, which is an extraordinary statement. And so some commentators incorrectly say that Paul is just using hyperbole mm. or, or saying, you know, it's so certain that he can talk about it as though it's already happened. And I think that they've just totally misunderstood Paul. Um, actually, no, this is real. It's happened now. But what we're talking about is a spiritual resurrection mm. from the dead you've been made alive. You were spiritually dead. Now you're spiritually made alive with Christ. Um, and that connects us to his physical resurrection, which inaugurates the new age mm -hmm. um, to which we look forward. So for Paul, um, the resurrection of Jesus, the death of Jesus is very important as well. And so is the ascension of Jesus. But the resurrection is the center, I think, for thinking about Paul's eschatology. So, so, so you have to take the resurrection and think back. Yeah. Look, look, look in the back. It's not like, um, sounds like, um, like E.P. Sanders when he said that Paul was working with something and then he had to go back to it to, to see, um, working backwards. Well, mm -hmm. most of reformational theology is the other way around. You work uh -huh. from the, from the problem to the solution, but well, Paul is 
it, would that be a, a, a proper way of, of describing what you're saying it's it's not a bad way to describe it um mm. yeah the, the, That's a limitation, the, the plight the mm -hmm. plight and the solution mm -hmm. you know sanders says you know, well paul's worked out what the solution is because mm -hmm. it's jesus resurrected from the dead so what mm. was the problem <laughs> yes and and yeah i i um I think that does make some sense for Paul um, that he is encountered on the road to Damascus by the resurrected mm -hmm. Jesus. And he's got to think, what does that mean? Um, well, first of all, it means that he is the Messiah, the promised Messiah, the son of mm -hmm. David, the King who will um, not be abandoned to the grave. And so the resurrection mm -hmm. for Paul establishes that Jesus is the promised King of Israel, the Messiah. Uh, but also, well, what does that mean? Um, and, and as I mentioned before, because he has achieved resurrection um, and uh, has been vindicated in a way that his death was um, not for his own sin, you know, uh, mm -hmm. then therefore we can be vindicated, or another word for that is justified. Yes, yes, I was thinking about that. By being in union with Christ. And so if mm -hmm. we have faith in Christ, we're connected to him, we have union with Christ, and therefore his justification becomes our justification, which is mm -hmm. why, again, we can also say um, that we have been justified through faith in Jesus, as Paul does say mm -hmm. um, in several places, uh, because the end judgment has already occurred for Jesus. He's already been justified and vindicated. And I think that that's, that because um, it's missing sometimes in the conversation. Correct. Uh, it is indeed. Uh, because in Latin America, we have this, um, uh, I don't want to name it, but na name names, but very, very strong John Piper uh, way of thinking mm -hmm. in Latin America, very strong uh, Southern Baptist um, string thinking. So justification is the main thing, you know, the doctrine for which the church stands or fall, as, as Luther said. But, but, um, but um, as you, I think, I don't know if you if 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 you're you're with me in this, but I think that Paul makes another argument in chapter 15 of uh of First Corinthians that is that the resurrection is the one that the doctrine, the one doctrine that uh, that the church stands or falls. I mean, I, I know that the Paul mm -hmm. uh, that Luther was going through uh, an, an, another certain issues during the Reformation, but uh, I, that's my my reading of it. So I, I agree. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, he does in 1 Corinthians 15 say, you know, if there's no resurrection from the dead, then our faith is useless. Mm. Um, and so it is the it is the linchpin. But also um, Protestants, uh, some types of Protestants have really struggled to connect the, re the resurrection of Jesus with justification by faith and with salvation. Mm -hmm. They connect it only to the death of Jesus to the cross. And I think for Paul, the death of Jesus is very important. He was delivered over to death for our transgressions. But in Romans 4.25, he says he was raised to life mm. for our justification. <laughs> and so if so you the, can't... The connection, the connection of resurrection. Yeah, if you, mm. And if you can't explain what Paul means there in Romans 4.25, then I would submit that you've not understood the resurrection of Jesus properly. Um, and so my understanding of Paul is that when he says in Romans 4.25, he was raised to life for our justification, it's exactly because... Jesus has been vindicated or justified in mm -hmm. his resurrection from the dead. And so judgment day has already occurred with respect to him. Mm. And he has been declared righteous before God. And through faith, we are brought into union with Christ. And so we are able to be declared right with God as well. In other words, justified or vindicated um, because we share in his vindication, we share in his justification. And so I think that um, sometimes um, Protestant theology um, wants to put everything on the death of Jesus. Mm. You know, Jesus died for our sins and that's how we're justified. Well, it's true. He died for our sins and, and that's part of the picture for sure. Um, but they sometimes neglect the, the significance of the resurrection. And in the New Testament, and, in, and for Paul in particular, the resurrection is massively significant, not mm. just because it proves that Christianity is true, but because it, um, it, it says so much theologically about who Jesus is and how we can be right with God. And, and also the time that we're living, like, like, like you mentioned in the beginning that we're living in between times, like, uh, the, the, the darkness is still approaching, still like uh, lynching, pinch, lynching back on, on, uh, on the day, but, 
there's still this tension that we're living as um, um, Eldong Lad now, not yet. That's right. Mm. The now and the not yet. And, th and that's because, as I mentioned, because of the resurrection of Jesus. So the resurrection of Jesus sets up that whole framework of the now and the not yet and the overlapping of the ages, which totally affects how we live as Christians. Mm. Um, yeah, because we're we're on the one hand still living in a world that is subjected to the old age, mm. but by the spirit, we are also at the same time connected to the new age. Um, and so the New Testament continually exhorts us to live as people of the new age, not of people of the old. Yes, and, and um, I, I believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit today, and sometimes my argument is that um, that some people don't, uh, the gifts of the Spirit are a sign of, of, of this new age. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not saying that everybody should speak in tongues and so on, but but I think that it's also a, a way of proclaiming the dark that the darkness has, is is going to be defeated. It's not mm -hmm. totally be defeated, and that's why what those people who say, "Well, if you believe in the gift of healing, go go to a hospital and heal everybody," it doesn't work that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I think I think for Paul too, the fruit of the spirit are very mm -hmm. important. Yes, not just the gifts of the spirit. Yes. So Galatians five. Don't live according to the flesh, and the flesh belongs to the old age, you see. Mm. Um, but walk according to the spirit, so the spirit belongs to the new age. And so if the spirit is in you, then you will um, demonstrate the fruit of the spirit, gentleness, patience, kindness, yes, um, et cetera, et cetera, rather than the fruit of the, the works of the flesh. Um, so that also, I think, demonstrates that the spirit is present. Yeah, yes. Yes. Uh, um, yes, before uh, our, our next question, this Sunday I led my service, I, I go to Baptist Church and I said, uh, I asked the members of the congregation if they saw the coronation of King Charles III. And I said, and I said what, you, what, what you mentioned um, in, uh, in Ephesians, we are seated <laughs> at the throne of God. We're going, we're seated right now. I mean, yeah. Charles was seated in a, in a physical throne, but we are seated with Christ in his throne. Yeah. And yeah. in Ephesians 2 and also in, in Revelations. Uh, yeah. we, we're called cool. so so that, that's something to it's look forward to. Incredible, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Yes, yes. Well, my second question would be then you suggest that Paul's hope of glory includes both individual salvation, and I think we touched a little bit on this, both individual salvation and the restoration of all creation. Mm -hmm. Can you expand on this idea and its implications for our understanding of eschatology, please? Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the other things that Protestants sometimes do is that we narrow um, the the teaching of the New Testament and, and the gospel in particular to an individual focus. This is particularly a Western mm. uh, Protestant type of thing and Western individualism where we say Jesus died for my sins to make me right with God. And that's the purpose of Jesus' death. And so the message that we preach is sort of like a one of individual salvation, but it's 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 that is there and that's true, and then the Bible teaches that. But it also teaches that that God is not just creating a people for Himself, but it, that mm. He is putting into works um, the renewal of the entire creation. Um, and so you see that in Romans chapter eight, for example, where Paul talks about the creation is groaning mm. with pangs of childbirth, just waiting for the sons of God to be revealed uh, and that the creation will be renewed and restored. And at the center of that creation will be the exalted Jesus Christ. And um, that cosmic understanding of Christ is is there in Romans eight, but particularly in Ephesians and Colossians. Yes, I was going to say, yeah, yes. That's right, where he is he is depicted as the center of creation and um, the one who sort of holds it all together. Um, and so this renewed creation um, sees Jesus at the center and that the purpose of the renewed creation will be to bring glory and honor to him and to God through him. Um, and so really the... Paul's vision is so much bigger than the vision that we usually have. Mm. And the one, the vision that we often talk about in church is often small. Although it's nice to hear that you said on Sunday, you were talking about this heavenly, <laughs> you know, we're seated with Christ mm. now. Um, that's terrific. 
um, and that is the picture that that it's a it's a cosmic picture mm-hmm. of Christ who's supreme over all creation, uh, and that his work, um, th- both through his death, uh, but also through his resurrection and ascension, um, has put into motion uh, this renewal of creation. And so that's why, that's what Paul is looking forward to. He's looking forward to the time when um, all of creation will glorify Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's why I call the book Paul and the Hope of Glory, um, that this is his, he has this cosmic hope for the universe, um, that it's going to be transformed by uh Christ. From my reading from Colossians and Ephesians, and it's good that you, uh, I'm very glad that you take the canonical b- view. I mean, I, whenever I mention that there are some seven letters that people don't believe the Paul, some people believe the Paul didn't write them, but I, ha- I have to say it because people people need to know this, at least the argument. Um, but when you mentioned regarding Ephesians and Colossians, I mentioned this on Twitter months ago and I said, Jesus didn't only die for our sins. He died to unite everything in heaven and earth that's what Ephesians and Colossians mm-hmm. say and I got a lynching from a lot of reform minded people really? Really? <laughs> because they said you are saying a blasphemy Jesus only died for our sins of the world that's all that of all the elect yeah. and I said Ephesians says something else and yeah. Colossians says something else he wants to renew the whole, whole of uh, creation yes that's we right. are the top, we are the top dog of creation because 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 we're making his image but he yeah. wants to renew everything else. I mean, can can, can you yes? Because um, I like you're, to follow this. Yeah, you're you're absolutely correct, brother. And uh, uh, I think this is an example where, um, uh, you know, some of our brothers and sisters are so fixated on a particular thing mm-hmm. that we find in the Bible that they're blind to other things that are also in the Bible. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so people are so in love with the idea that Jesus died for my sins that they ignore and even deny sometimes that he also died to overthrow the powers of evil, mm. uh, to conquer death and sin and the devil and to renew the created order. Uh, and the the problem, of course, is that's exactly what Paul <laughs> believed yes. and taught. Uh, it's what the New Testament teaches. So it, it means that we need to... Um, read the whole Bible, uh, not just our favorite bits. And mm, and this yes. comes back to why I wanted to write a book that dealt with all the letters that mm. bear Paul's name, because if you don't do that, then you're going to get a warped view of what he taught. You need mm. to look at the whole. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, and, and for those who want to follow this, this is mainly chapter 16 uh, of your book, uh, and, and, and I mean, I was I was thinking of the cosmic new creation in page four or eight. Well, that's where you started your your conversation about that. Well, our, our question number three then. One of the central themes in your book is the importance of resurrection in post theology. Can you discuss why resurrection? You have said it, but uh, can you discuss why resurrection is so crucial to Paul's understanding of salvation and how it sets him apart from other Jewish and Hellenistic Hellenistic thinkers of his time? Because uh, Yes, because they had, he he was more on the Jewish side, but uh, he differed in certain things, and you have mentioned some. But um, let, let, I want to hear from you. Yeah, well, I guess I've said a bit already, but mm-hmm. I think the key thing for Paul is that he did share the common Jewish hope that resurrection would come uh, for all God's people, that God would raise the righteous, and mm-hmm. that when Jesus is resurrected, this has happened ahead of time in inaugurating the new alongside the old. Um, but this is why Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 describes Jesus as the first fruits, because the first fruit, you know, is a um, a farming mm-hmm. image mm-hmm. so that when, when the um, first fruit comes, you can, you can see, okay, the crop is coming, um, but you can see the quality of the crop mm-hmm. from the first fruit. So the first fruit gives mm-hmm. you hope that the crop is coming, but it also tells you about the nature of the crop. And so Jesus says the first fruit of the resurrection, resurrection of the dead. Um, Paul uses that in 1 Corinthians 15 to say, look, he's risen from the dead with an immortal body, mm-hmm. a glorified body, uh, and he will never die again. 
And if he's the first fruits of the resurrection, that means that you and I are also going to be resurrected one day with an immortal, glorified body that will never again be subjected to death and decay. Mm -hmm. um, so that's extraordinarily important for Paul's hope. Uh, that is the Christian hope. Resurrection is the Christian hope. Um, not just to be resurrected to eternal life in some abstract you know, existence, mm. but resurrected to eternal life with God, uh, in fellowship with God, in community with God and God's people, um, in God's renewed creation. So um, it, it really is like centrally significant for Paul, not just for understanding what Jesus did back then, 2,000 years ago, but what it will mean for us in 2,000 years' time or whenever mm. it is that we're resurrected from the dead. Mm, yes. Uh, and, and about what's the difference between the Hellenistic view uh, of resurrection? Um, well, we know uh, from uh, uh, Acts 17, I was going to say in Spanish, Hechos, Acts 17, uh, but uh, but it, 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 it's, it's, it's that's, the Greeks rejected the view of Judaism, yes, uh, regarding the resurrection. Correct. Yeah, the, the Jewish view is very weird because <laughs> they believed that um, people would be resurrected physically mm. uh, because the, the Jewish way of viewing the human was that the mind, body, and soul were all connected and would remain connected. Mm. Uh, whereas the Greek view was that, you know, there was something wrong with the flesh. The, the flesh is evil or it's temporary at least, and it, it's not worthy of the soul. And so death really liberates the soul from mm. the flesh. Um, so any sense of resurrection, well, there there is no real sense of resurrection. There might be a sense of life after death, but mm. it's not a physical life after death. It's a disembodied spirit. Um, and so when Paul uh, in the Areopagus in Athens talks about the resurrection from the dead, this is a like a shocking claim uh, that the Greeks, well, some mock him and some are intrigued, but they certainly like um, were not used to that idea and found that a, a, a challenging idea okay yeah. well uh yeah uh, <laughs> that um is is um a lot of people uh i think in today in western christianity also still follow a little bit greek way yeah. of thinking yeah and that it's important to recognize that that is a a non-christian view Mm. of the disembodied spirit that's going to go up and play harp on the clouds. Yes. <laughs> uh, and your body doesn't matter what happens to your body. No, uh, the Bible teaches that your body will be raised. And that's why inherited from Judaism, Christians have had the tradition of burying their dead mm -hmm. because for within Judaism, burial of the dead was um, a, uh, a witness to the view that they would be raised from the dead. That they would stand up again. And that's why cremation, I mean, God can raise you from the dead if you've been cremated, that's okay. Or if you're lost at sea, that's yes. fine. That's all right. Eat, eat them and, by sharks. And, <laughs> yeah. It, you know, God God will ra still raise you from the dead. But the point is that it's a it's a testimony. Mm. Um, when you choose to be buried, um, you are you are declaring that God is going to raise me up out of the grave. Um, and that's a distinctly um, Christian view inherited from the distinctly Jewish view. Mm, okay, well, yes, I uh, guess that's like I said, the uh, Western Christianity, like, like what you mentioned, we think that we die, and finally, we we, we and we forget that in Second Corinthians five, it says that we're going to be judged according to what we did on in our bodies. So, yeah. <laughs> so body still counts. Uh, well, right. Question number four: Your book also touches on the issue of participation in Christ which you argue is a key component of Paul's theology of salvation. Can you explain what participation in Christ means and how it relates to other aspects of Paul's thought? Well, I wrote another 500-page book on that subject. Yes, I know. Uh, I don't know where it is. <laughs> I have it cool. too. <laughs> yeah. Paul and Union with Christ, um, yes. where I did the same thing and looked through all the canonical Paul mm. letters. Um, and and chase that through for the theme of union with Christ participation. Mm. Uh, and I, I argue in the book that um, uh, that the best way to understand Paul's teaching in this area is to kind of set of umbrella terms of union, participation, uh, identification, 
and um what's the fourth one um <laughs> incorporation sorry mm -hmm. incorporation yeah so union participation identification incorporation and what union refers to is is the idea that when we have faith in jesus we're connected to him like husband and wife you know we mm. um we we are in him and he is mm -hmm. in us uh and that everything that is his becomes ours um you know just as what happens in marriage so if he's righteous uh we share in his righteousness mm. um and so on uh participation um i use that term to refer to uh events of christ's narrative that we share in so paul says that we died with christ we were buried with christ uh, we were raised with christ made alive with christ even ascended with christ Mm. Yes, uh, so yes, the with yes. the with Christ language is what I use the participation word for, uh, that we actually participate in these events with him. So when Christ died, we died with him. And when he's resurrected, we're resurrected with him. Um, well, I'm, yeah. I'm writing down the name of the book, Union with Christ. Uh, so, so Paul, I, Paul uh, in Union with Christ. Paul yeah. in Union. So, so it's still a polling theme that, you, that, that you're exploring. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Then the third term, identification, means that um, uh, we are no longer identified with the old age uh, and with the um, with the with our old existence as people who are spiritually dead and cut off from God. But now we are identified with Christ and the new age, or with Christ's kingdom, or with the realm of Christ's rule. Yes. Um, so our sort of address has changed our spiritual address has changed and then the fourth term incorporation acknowledges that um it's not just jesus died for my sins and he makes me right with god but if if i'm made right with god and you're made right with god then we're made right with each other yeah <laughs> and we're incorporated into the body of christ if i am in union with christ and you're in union with christ we're in union with each other and that has all sorts of implications for how we live as christians and fellowship with one another so the four terms union participation identification and incorporation um sort of try to capture all of paul's teaching around that theme of union with christ and, and out of out of interest because we live here in australia and regarding indigenous peoples the union with Christ, because because I see that sometimes, not only here in Australia but even in Latin America, Indigenous people they um, who have no Christian background, uh, but when they become a Christian, do you think there's there, there, there's there's like um, they want to be still be, be um, counted as, as as Indigenous people, but yet in Christ you become a new tribe in a sense, mm. and and that's something that. Um, uh, I have a Jewish background, mm -hmm. and although oh. I was I wasn't raised a Jew, but my dad, I mean, I don't eat pork. He he always would tell us to to do certain things, and so, and that had really caused sometimes some friction because, I yes, I feel a bit different, but at the same time, I'm part of, I'm a Christian. I mean, I, I follow Jesus, yeah. so it, it, I always think about indigenous people how they, they would they, they would feel that they 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 yes, they're part of a people. But now in Jesus, they become part of these other people and how they deal with the past or with their ancestors. And Well, that's, that's a great a question. Yeah, I think uh, our union with Christ and our identity in Christ mm -hmm. doesn't um, erase the other things that identify us. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm in Christ, but I'm also still an Australian citizen. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't erase that. They're, they're not incompatible um and and i'm in christ but i'm also a jazz musician and that helps mm. to define who i am as well you know mm -hmm. and i'm part of a community that of people who play jazz and and that sort of thing so um so even though paul says in christ there's no male female there's no slave or free um on one level that's true meaning that those distinctions don't keep us apart anymore mm. In Christ, in Christ, mm -hmm. we're all one. Mm -hmm. In Christ Jesus, whether you're male, female, slave, or free, but it doesn't mean that males are no longer male, mm -hmm. and it doesn't mean that females are no longer female, mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't even mean that slaves are no longer slaves. You yes. know, Paul addresses <laughs> Christian slaves yes. and tells them how to be good slaves. Mm -hmm. uh, 
which is maybe a conversation for another time but yes. um, but um all that to say is you know you can be in, in more than one group um but if you're in christ that must be the the primary group that mm. defines who you are and also the one that defines your salvation you're not yeah. you're not ethnically um you're not saved by you're not saved by uh, belonging to an ethnic group yeah. or or uh, an ideology because um <laughs> my in my in I, like i told you before we started um uh, recording um uh, i grew up in the united states and and um, most of my mom's uh, the family i grew up with is my mom's side and and i know that in the us and you live in the us uh, in some in some parts you if you are um if you don't think in a particular political way you're actually you're not safe <laughs> mm. according to some people's views so so yeah sadly. That, that, yes That's yes sadly true yes yeah. well our next question will be number five in your view what are some of the most common misunderstandings or misinterpretations of post theology of salvation and how do you address them in your book uh we've covered a couple of them yes. one would be that when you die and go to heaven that you're going to remain a bodiless spirit mm. um that's that's not a christian view it's not a biblical view um you might be dis- there's there are a couple of different opinions about this you might be disembodied for a little while until the resurrection of mm. the of the body uh but the ultimate goal is that you'll be um in in the body as a re- resurrected mm-hmm. person whole person so that's one uh another is as, also as we've mentioned that salvation is only for the individual um and it's only about my individual sin no you know um jesus came to restore the world mm. and the universe and that includes defeating the power yes. of death the power of sin um the forces that corrupt uh our universe and and subject it to decay um so the work of jesus goes well beyond the individual and well beyond even just humanity um mm. and so we need we need to stop having such an anthropocentric view of jesus mission um jesus came to save the universe <laughs> yes uh to renew creation um not only to save humanity of course saving humanity is an important part of that i, I don't um, remember an american an american preacher uh saying some years ago why do we shouldn't care about the, the earth is going to be destroyed anyway yeah. <laughs> and he had a lot of well, because well you're old <laughs> you don't have much to go but <laughs> there's still kids <laughs> going around that they need to live for uh they, need, they, they still need water they still need air to breathe <laughs> yeah so Yeah, well, it's interesting. I, I mean, I think I argued in, in the book that the earth will not be destroyed. It will mm. be renewed. Yes. Um, that's, now, that's... sometimes we, you get the language of the earth being destroyed from Revelation and and one Peter, uh, one and two Peter. But, um, but I think that's apocalyptic imagery. Um, in reality, Paul's view is the, is the clearest in Romans 8 that mm, yes. there will be a renewal of, of the creation rather than the old set aside and a brand new one created um they'll like be like our continu- bodies like, exactly our bodies are a perfect metaphor for that because <laughs> um, because the, the, the thinking is that like the earth explodes you know <laughs> and yeah then yeah. everything comes back i don't see jesus exploding i don't see myself <laughs> no. exploding and then coming back yeah that's uh... that's right yeah there was no there was no old body in the tomb when jesus was yes. re- resurrected his his existing body was renewed and perfected and so you can say in a way he has a new body but it's actually uh the same body that's been renewed uh and the same is going to be true of creation um so there are a few things that i think christians uh, make mistakes about um they obviously make mistakes related to eschatology about being able to predict mm. when jesus will return um issues to do with the rapture uh those those sorts of things um and you know the, i think the bible is pretty clear that we're not going to know jesus is clear mm-hmm. and paul is clear citing jesus um that he will come like a thief in the night mm-hmm. uh meaning we we won't know when he's going to come so he could come anytime and you you won't be able to predict it 
Mm, better be working. <laughs> better working for him. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Well, um, uh, number six, then, uh, your book engages with a wide range of biblical and theological scholarship on Paul. Can you discuss some of the major debates and disagreements in this field and how your own work contributes or challenges them? And I, and I know that these are chapter one and two mainly because uh, you, uh, when I started reading, that's what got me hooked into the book. Oh, right. I want to I wanna know what everybody's saying about this thing. So yeah. can you yeah. elaborate, please? Sure. One of the big ones that uh, Pauline scholars uh, have been debating for uh, in recent years is whether Paul is an apocalyptic theologian. And what they mean by that is that um, uh, we have apocalyptic literature like the book of Revelation, but also lots of um, Jewish literature like Four Maccabees and Two Esdras and, mm -hmm. and other books like that, that they depict um, often end time things, but not necessarily end time things, usually through a vision, mm -hmm. uh, maybe mediated by an angelic being, an angel, and there's incredible imagery used like so if you're familiar with revelation you know the beast with the horns and the heads and all, all the stuff this is apocalyptic imagery and it was used as a literary device to paint a picture that words really can't convey i mean really mm. that's what i think it's for it's it's to expand your imagination and to make you think of well whoa, this is so far beyond our experience you know, uh, what God is going to do. Um, now, Paul doesn't write apocalyptic literature. He doesn't write like the book of Revelation. He writes letters. They're pretty standard letters. They're they're relatively easy to understand. There are no um, beasts with 10 heads and four horns and six crowns and, you know, serpents coming out of the ocean and stuff like that. It, they're just letters. Um, but um, what some scholars argue is that his theology is apocalyptic in nature. So even though he's he's not writing apocalyptic literature, the idea is that the, the apocalyptic literature that we already have actually represents a way of thinking about God and a way of thinking about the world that has become known as apocalyptic theology. Mm. And some of the characteristics of this theology is that you know, God is going to act in a dramatic way. You know, he's going to slam his fist down and boom, everything's going to blow up. Or, um, you know, this sort of dramatic action of God. And there's a big, strong contrast between good and evil and night and day and darkness and light and, um, and all this sort of stuff. Um, and so they argue that Paul, even though he's writing letters, he actually has a, a, a theology Mm. that has been shaped by apocalypticism um and you can you can see what they mean like he does talk about night and day and evil and good and light and darkness and he does talk about you know a day that is coming um and he does talk sometimes about dramatic actions of god um so with the trumpet so this he comes with a trumpet the, of, of he will, and, the yes. trumpet will sound and the dead yes. shall be raised you know um in 1 Thessalonians 4 so so they argue that you know Paul has at least he has apocalyptic elements um in his theology there are others who argue against that view and say no there's nothing apocalyptic about Paul because instead of the, the instead of the vertical dramatic action of God Paul talks about the the horizontal slow working of God mm. you know through the covenants through the promises to Abraham and Moses and Israel and the promise fulfillment schema that culminates in the arrival of Jesus and his death and resurrection and ascension. Um, and so, and so Paul doesn't see God as working like a fist coming down from heaven. He sees God working out over centuries and millennia slowly, but surely to fulfill his prophecies. Mm. And um, I guess my conclusion is um, they're both right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I take a sort of both and approach that, um, yes, there are apocalyptic elements. The trumpet shall sound, um, the last days, the dark and the, the, the night will end, the day will dawn, um, the darkness will give way to the light. These are, these are apocalyptic images. 
Um, but he also does have the slow, patient working of God through a promise, fulfillment, and covenant um, salvation history approach, which I think is clear in the Bible, and I mm-hmm. think it's also clear in Paul. So I disagree with the apocalyptic interpreters of Paul who say that he has no uh, horizontal view of God's action. I think that's clearly incorrect. He clearly does. But I disagree with those who say he has no vertical action mm-hmm. of God because I think he does that also. So Paul holds them both together. Yes. Um, that, that yes, God has been working patiently through his promises uh, and through his covenants and through salvation history for centuries and millennia. Um, but also uh, when he acts um, at certain points, it is a thunderclap from the heavens, mm. you know, um, like Paul's own encounter with the resurrected Jesus and it's yes. blinding light from the heavens, you know, God can and does act like that too. And that the two things are not mutually exclusive. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I like what you said about the apocalyptic Paul, because in Latin America, we're still going about the new perspective on Paul. And I always tell him, um, I was still, um, I'm, I'm known as one of the perpetrators of the new perspective on Paul. Oh, because yeah. it, oh. it really, it really caught my attention when I, uh, in, the, in the early 2000s. And, and I translated some of anti rights essays. And just to let you know, next month I'll publish on my website um, uh, Jimmy Dunn's uh, um, New Perspective on Paul, the, the uh. original. Because I asked, cause, and this is what bothers me of, of some um, Spanish speaking scholars that they talk about this like, uh, oh, yeah, the apocalyptic Paul, their perspective on Paul, but they never translate anything into Spanish. Okay. So I took like, Two months just translating Dan's uh, uh, essay, and I also translated the Paul of history and the Paul of faith also um, by 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 right, and I'm trying to get somebody to translate um, Sanders' um, um, a book on, uh, on 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 Palestinian Judaism. I was very glad to see that your book was translated. Uh, once I said yeah. to my friend, "Hey, can you translate this guy? This guy looks like interesting." He said, "Oh, okay. Tell me which book. I'll, I'll bring it on over, and 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 I'll and I'll see if um if there's a need, and there there's a need, and uh, hopefully we get Paul in union with Christ as well. <laughs> that would be great. But 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 the point is that I I tell people, your perspective on Paul. That there's this thing in Spanish because. Two very known preachers um, said that anti right was a heretic and that and that and that and the new perspective on Paul was a heresy. And I and, and when they asked me, what do you think? And I said, well, people in the academy, they don't they know about the new perspective of Paul because it has become part of the part of the furniture. But now they're talking about the apocalyptic Paul and the Paul within Judaism. They, they, mm. they have moved on. They have moved on. Yes. Uh, uh, it's, this is this this happened almost fifty years ago, mm. um, and I'm glad that you mentioned that because because I'm always trying to tell them this is in a scholarship. This has moved on. <laughs> the new perspective yeah. on Paul. I, I I I don't know if if you think this, but the new perspective on Paul won the day. <laughs> yes, yeah. uh, face the fact and <laughs> move on. Yeah, well, I think I have a similar uh, opinion as to the apocalyptic poll that there's it's it's yes and no like it's it's a both and mm. um and and it also depends whose new perspective on paul you're yes. talking about because yes. they run uh right Dunn, sanders they have different views yes yeah. different views yes well um our number seven uh, question is you argue that paul's hope of glory has important implications for how we live our lives here and now like you mentioned, no disembodied bodies. <laughs> Can you explain how the eschatological dimension of Paul's thought relates to ethical concerns and practical Christian living, what, what you were saying, mm. or what I was mm. thinking, actually, uh, caring about the earth? <laughs> yeah, well, I think for Paul, hope, uh, let me put it this way, Paul and the hope of glory, um, what I wanted to get with that title, even though it's it's also what Paul says in Colossians chapter one, verse 27. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, but um, the two things go together in a very important way. First of all, glory is what's going to happen right at the end when the universe is, when the creation is renewed and all creation brings glory and honor to Jesus. uh, And we're in our resurrected bodies and we will partake in that glory and share in that glory ourselves. So this is this incredible conclusion to the story that Paul looks forward to. Uh, but that's in the future. But the hope 
the hope is now mm. and the hope the hope looks to the future so the hope connects us now to what's going to happen in the future it's not um, a baseless hope it's not just wishing or wishful thinking mm. it's a certain hope um, but it is future looking um, so that we can live in light of this future glory uh, and so I think Paul is driven by that hope of glory um, and the way that he lives, the way that he was able to encounter hardship, the way he was able to deal with um, suffering and torture and ultimately <laughs> yes. and, and ultimately going to his death. Uh, he had a hope for future glory and that enabled him to endure all things in this life. And so that's an incredibly important message for us in the church today where it's so easy for us not only to be individualistic but to be consumerist to just focus on our own well-being um, and to only think about life here and now and sure okay good you know i'm a christian so it means when i die i'll be with god so that's good but basically i'm living for now mm. um, paul paul won't let us do that and sure now is important it's not as though now is not important what we do now matters um, but we don't live for now. We live for the future. Uh, and we have the future living in us through the Holy Spirit. The, the Spirit is from the future. <laughs> the Spirit is the Back Spirit the is from the Yeah, the Spirit is from the new age mm. that's been inaugurated by Christ's resurrection from the dead. Um, and so we have the new with us, and so we keep in step with the Spirit, and that will enable us to live in light of that future glory rather than living just for the here and now um which is so you know pathetic. fatalistic fatalistic i mean well well it is yeah and everything in this life is subject to decay um and it's passing all our glory is passing in this life um and we we will face loss and grief grief and death um oh, yes yeah i'm turning 50 and I, I, uh, this year and i can see my body became faster than usual. <laughs> yeah, me too. Uh, yes, I, I lost my hair. I see. Uh, I used to have hair. And my wife says so I used to be used to be a good-looking man. No, I'm sorry, <laughs> I, ne I never was a good-looking man. <laughs> um, what, 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 my my two cents in this in, in what you're saying. I go back to what I said before. Second Corinthians chapter two, um, verse Second uh, uh, Corinthians chapter five. That we're gonna give account to whatever we did in our bodies. And if I have a hope that I will receive a um, a um, a uh, crown mm -hmm. from Jesus, then mm -hmm. I'll, I'll 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 live differently from everybody That's else. Right. I'll, I'll and I ask the Holy Spirit again. It goes back to um, Romans eight. Uh, uh, I like that that you have um, mentioned Romans eight time and time again. And, and let me let me tell you once once I was I was younger and and, and I was saying Lord, how can I how can I um, um, overcome these temptations or overcome these difficulties, and and I felt that the Lord led me to read them, uh, uh, Romans eight, mm. but but if by the Spirit you put the deeds of of the flesh to death, and mm. I, I forget how it goes in English, <laughs> uh, and then it continues, and it made me cry. Mm. It was around two o'clock, and I said so because mm. I said so. You mean that every every when I put all my strength, I have to just let allow the spirit, the power of the new age, to do the work, mm. and yeah, it really broke me. At two mm. a.m. Oh, that's amazing. Well, our final question is: finally, how do you hope your book will contribute to ongoing conversation about Pauline theology and the nature of Christian hope? Are there any specific ideas or insights that you hope readers will take away from your book? Mm. Yeah, well, I hope that it will um, uh, help people to think more clearly about Paul's overall teaching about eschatology and not just on specific passages, although deal with all the passages in detail, but um, but the overall shape of it. Mm -hmm. And I hope that they will, they will see that it is Christological so that eschatology stems for Paul from Christ himself, his life death resurrection and ascension um and that everything that he knows eschatologically is sort of is sort of in there already in embryonic form and he sort of helps it to unfold 
in his understanding. Um, and I, I really, I really wish that people would develop a stronger understanding of the importance of the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, and I think that that has been sorely lacking, uh, especially in the Western church. Um, we're pretty good at talking about the death of Jesus, uh, not very good at understanding the significance of Jesus' resurrection, the theological significance, not just the historical significance. I think uh, um, when you talk about the importance of the resurrection, I come to think, I get church leaders, you know, I get the, the letter every week. And there's a famous, and you may be aware of this famous preacher in the U.S., Southern Baptist preacher, who who says that the resurrection is the most important thing in Christianity. Mm. And he has had a lot of flack. Mm. And, and it makes me feel like people are so much against our hope of resurrection. Mm. Um And, and, and he's been amazed because uh, I heard him saying, um, he's been interviewed by other people, said, well, what I mean is that the resurrection, we go back from, from the resurrection, we go back and, and see all the Christian theology that we, that how Paul and how the Bible develops it. Um, but in, in, in the flag is that uh, the, the, the opposing side says, no, but the, the death of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the, the one that defines us. And yeah. this guy is saying, no, it's the resurrection. And and, and again, I go back to uh, when when I say the same thing, I said, okay, you deal with, with the man who wrote it. Uh, First Corinthians chapter 15, if the resurrection is not right, then we're liars. We, yeah. we don't have any hope. That's <laughs> our, right. our faith is useless. It's false That's faith. Right. We're still in our sins. We're still in our sins. Not so because Jesus of the cross. Jesus died for our sins, mm -hmm. but was not resurrected then we're the, still in our sins. And the resurrection is the vindication of that of that sacrifice. That's right. And that's where they lose yeah. the link. Yeah. Well, um, Con, I, let me thank you again. Um, people can buy this book. I'll say it in Spanish. Um, pueden comprar este libro. Van a ver ustedes el link abajo en Amazon eh, para que ustedes puedan comprar este libro eh, por Constantin Cambo, eh, Pablo y la Esperanza de Gloria. Un estudio exegético y teológico. I was going to say, yeah, I forgot about that. You use a lot of biblical theology. <laughs> Un estudio exegético y teológico sobre la escatología paulina. El mejor libro en el momento sobre la escatología paulina. Si usted quiere saber qué es lo que Pablo dice con respecto al fin del mundo y, y cómo esto nos afecta a nosotros y al resto del cosmos, este es el libro de leer. Thank you, Con. Uh, if you can stay after we finish and so, so we can um, just sure. talk about it a little bit. Um, so yeah, thank um, you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Con. And uh, and hopefully and hopefully I'll, I'll I'll talk to my friend to to Jesus from Kerigma and I'll see if we can get uh, the 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 efficient commentary. Great, the efficient That'd be commentary awesome. and this one. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll I'll keep you posted. Thank you very much. Terrific. Thank you, Luis. Thank you. Thanks for having me.